Good morning. morning. Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's so good to see all of you this morning. And greetings to those who are following us online today. As we begin, please silence your cell phone. Make sure you read all the announcements in your bulletin. And by the way, the announcements in the bulletin every Sunday are the same as the ones that go out on the Friday greeting. So you can read them on the Friday greeting on your computer as well. Uh, Each pew has a white response card, a place for prayer concerns on one side. On the other side is a place for uh, you to ask for information about our church if you're a first-time visitor. And uh, greetings to any visitors we may have today. And there will be a Stevens minister at the altar at the conclusion of the service to pray for anyone who needs prayer. This afternoon at 4 at First Baptist Church, come join Paul Syke, Harold Harvey, and other members of our choir for a patriotic presentation, America Keeps Singing. You want to say anything else about that? Uh, It is a wonderful, uh, about a four-hour program. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It is uh, about 50 minutes if you're worried about time or anything, but it is a wonderful chance uh, to come together. The music feels absolutely uh, wonderful, and uh, you'll get to hear some solos, you'll get to hear uh, organ pieces. Uh, It's just a wonderful time, and we're very honored to be a part of this in our community. Uh, and while I'm standing here, let me also say thank you to all those who joined us on Thursday in Beaufort for the prime time of trip. Absolutely amazing time. And who would know that we would be at the museum when they were taking things out from the Queen Anne's Revenge to test them. So we got to see her hand off, wonderful lunch, cloud it over, ended up being a little cooler. It was a wonderful time. So, but we missed all of you. So please watch. You've got the list of things that are going on, and we look forward to a wonderful day at the palace in July. And as always, thank you so very much uh, for your love and support of the music ministry. Thank you, Paul. Our new associate pastors, Tyler Moore and Carol Grantham, officially joined us as of yesterday. They are part of our staff. And Carol and her husband, Scott, are here today. She probably didn't want me to point her out, but they sneaked in here. They're trying to be inconspicuous. <laughs> Forget that, that's not going to work. People already know who y'all are, so we're glad to have you with us today. Next Sunday will be their first Sunday actually uh, helping us in worship. Uh, There's a reception following the 11 o'clock service next Sunday for our two new associate pastors, so you're all invited to come and meet them in person. And then finally, uh, Vacation Bible School is week after next. Their mission focus this year is the Humane Society, and in your bulletin and in Friday greetings is a list of items that they need. Uh, They want donations for that so that they can help those animals out. And uh, also, um, Sarah told me this morning that we have 40 volunteers, and we need snacks for them. So we need donations of snacks for our volunteers. That's another way that you can help out. And we do appreciate anything that you can do to help. Are there any other announcements that I need to make this morning? Anybody that has anything? May God bless you with his grace, his love, and his peace, now and forevermore. Amen.
Good morning. morning. Please join me in our call to worship. Stand as able, and this will be responsibly. God will judge among many people. Our first hymn this morning is 696, America the Beautiful. Good morning. The first reading today is from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised among the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the Lord of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may 
that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel lesson is from John chapter 15, verses 12 through 13. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. seated. I'm going to tell you a story today. It's probably one that many of you are familiar with, but even if it is, please bear with me because I promise you there are things in this story that you may not have heard before. In November 1942, four men from different parts of the country became acquainted while attending chaplain school at Harvard University. One look at the mild-mannered John P. Washington would have left you with the impression that he wasn't the kind of man to go to war and become a hero. His love of music and his beautiful voice contrasted with the toughness inside. One of nine children in an Irish immigrant family living in the roughest part of Newark, New Jersey, he learned through sheer determination to hold his own in any fight. At age 12, he'd miraculously recovered from a nearly fatal throat infection. He told his sister, God must have something special for me to do. And God called John Washington to ministry, returning him to the streets of Newark to organize sports teams, play ball with young boys who needed a friend to look up to, and inspire others with his hymns of praise and thanksgiving. Ohio native Clark Poling gave up a law career in Michigan to enter seminary. After he was ordained, he served a church in Schenectady, New York. When the war came, he was married. He had a two-year-old son. His wife was expecting another child, but he was determined to enter the army. He told his father, I'm not going to hide behind the church in some safe office out of the firing line. Poling later wrote to his father, don't pray for my safe return. Pray that I do my duty. Like Clark Poling, Alexander Good had followed in the steps of his own father in ministry. His first years of service as a rabbi were in Marion, Indiana, and then he moved to York, Pennsylvania. While studying to prepare to minister to the needs of others, he had joined the National Guard. Ten months before Pearl Harbor, he sought an assignment in the Navy's chaplain corps. Initially, he wasn't accepted. Then the war started in December 41. He wanted more than ever to serve those who went into harm's way to defend freedom and human dignity, so he did so as a U.S. Army chaplain. The oldest of the four chaplains was 42-year-old Vermont native George Fox, who enlisted in the Army the same day his 18-year-old son, Wyatt, enlisted in the Marines. George Fox had also served in World War I while only 17 years old, by convincing the Army that he was 18 and enlisting as a medical corps assistant. Fox's courage on the battlefield had earned him the Silver Star, the Croix de Guerre, and the Purple Heart. After the war, he simultaneously served several small churches in Vermont. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, he told his wife, I have to go. I know what those boys are going to face. Upon meeting in November 1942 at chaplain school, 
The four men quickly became friends. Let's jump ahead two months to January 1943. The four men were assigned to the Dorchester, a former luxury liner converted to a troop transport. On January 23, 1943, the Dorchester set off from New York with 902 on board, most of them young, inexperienced infantry troops. Many were going to sea for the first time and suffered seasickness for many days. Even if they survived the Atlantic crossing, they had nothing to look forward to, only the prospect of dying young in a war on foreign soil. They were men needing a strong shoulder to lean on, a firm voice to encourage them, and a ray of hope in a world of darkness. And in their midst moved the four chaplains. They spent a lot of their time doing what is called the ministry of presence, just having informal conversations, doing footlock or counseling with the troops, and visiting the sick. They tried to break the tension of the voyage. Father Washington came up on a poker game and a soldier at the table asked, Father, would you bless my hand? <laughs> Washington took a peek and then answered, What? Waste a blessing on a measly pair of deuces? <laughs> As officers on board, the chaplains knew the destination, but this classified information had been withheld from the troops. However, when the Dorchester docked at St. John's, Newfoundland, everybody correctly guessed that the convoy was headed for Greenland and would have to pass through what had become known as Torpedo Junction. On February the 3rd, as the ship journeyed north through gale force winds, the sonar picked up a submarine. The soldiers were in their bunks as it grew dark, but few could sleep. To prepare for the worst, the Dorchester's captain told the soldiers to sleep in their clothing and their life jackets. But it was so hot below deck, with so many bodies packed into close quarters, that many of the men slept in their underwear the life jackets were also hot and bulky, so many men set them aside as an inconvenience. A periscope silently broke the sea surface in the cold, windy hours after midnight. Shortly before one in the morning, the captain of the German submarine U-456 gave the command to fire. The night was shattered by the flash and roar of a blinding explosion as the torpedo hit the lower midsection of the ship on the starboard side. A second torpedo hit followed the first, instantly killing a hundred of the men on board. Power was knocked out in the engine room and darkness engulfed the ship as water began rushing through gaping wounds in the Dorchester's hull. As the ship listed to starboard, life jackets were tossed about in the darkness where no one would ever be able to find them. Wounded men cried out in pain, frightened survivors screamed in terror, groping frantically in the dark for exits that they couldn't see. No one sent up a distress flare, so most of the other vessels in the convoy were unaware that the Dorchester had been hit. And with no power, the ship couldn't contact the escort ships. The testimony of survivors reveals that the only order in this chaos came from those chaplains. They calmly quieted the men and guided them to their boat stations. They opened up a storage locker and distributed life jackets. Chilled to the bone, Petty Officer John J. Mahoney headed back toward his cabin. Where are you going, son? A voice asked. I need my gloves, Mahoney replied. Here, take these, said Rabbi Good as he handed a pair of gloves to the young officer who would never have survived the trip back to his captain, back cabin and back to safety. I can't take those gloves, Mahoney replied. Never mind, the rabbi responded. I have another pair. Mahoney slipped the gloves over his hands and returned to the frigid deck, never stopping to think until much later, after he was safe, that there was no way the rabbi would have been carrying a spare pair of gloves. And as that thought finally dawned on him, he understood what must have been going on in the mind of the chaplain. Somehow Rabbi Good had already decided he was never going to leave the Dorchester. In less than 30 minutes, icy water flowed across the deck of the sinking ship. Working against time, the chaplains continued to pass out life vests as the soldiers pressed forward in a ragged line, and then the lockers were empty. All the life jackets were gone, and those still in line re re realized they were doomed. There was no hope for them. But something amazing happened, something those survivors would never forget. All four chaplains removed their life jackets and put them on the men around them. Together, they sacrificed their own last hope for survival. 
to ensure the survival of others. Finally, those fortunate enough to reach lifeboats struggle to distance themselves from the Dorchester lest they be pulled under by the suction created as the ship sank. Then amid the screams of pain and horror that filled the cold, dark night, they heard the strong voices of the chaplains. The four men offered prayers for the dying and encouragement for those who would live. Looking back, the survivors saw the four chaplains giving strength to others by their final valiant declaration of faith. Their arms were linked as they braced against the railing and leaned into each other for support. A Methodist, a Jew, a Reformed Christian, and a Roman Catholic. <coughs> 27 minutes after the first torpedo hit, the stern lifted high out of the water and the Dorchester disappeared beneath the freezing waters. Over 600 men died, including the chaplains. At the military chaplain school <coughs> at Fort Monmouth, there is a life preserver from the Dorchester in the museum. For their sacrificial bravery, the four chaplains were posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross and the Purple Heart, along with a special Congressional Medal for Heroism made exclusively for those four men. In 1951, at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, President Truman dedicated the Chapel of the Four Chaplains, a sanctuary dedicated to promoting interfaith cooperation and respect. Inside are three altars, one Catholic, one Protestant, and one Jewish, in honor of our nation's respect for religious diversity and our privilege of free worship. The four chaplains were also depicted in a 1948 commemorative postage stamp. As moving as their story is, they weren't the only heroes that day. Charles Walter David Jr. was born on June the 20th, 1917 in New York City. Little is known about his childhood, but as an African-American, he had few economic opportunities. In March 1941, he enlisted in the U.S. Coast Guard despite having a wife and a three-year-old son. In the segregated military, David was given menial work in the ship kitchens. Nevertheless, he worked and was promoted to mess attendant first class. After Pearl Harbor, David was assigned to the Coast Guard cutter Comanche. There he was responsible for maintaining the officers' quarters. The Comanche and a second Coast Guard cutter, the Escanaba, were the only ships who saw the torpedoing of the Dorchester. The captain of the Comanche ignored the risk of another torpedo attack and maneuvered his ship to start picking up survivors from the freezing North Atlantic. The Comanche's crew lowered rope climbing nets to the lifeboats, but many survivors were too weak from the cold to climb to safety. Ten-foot waves also threatened to toss soldiers into the icy water if they slipped or their lifeboats capsized. Witnessing this crisis, Charles David and some other men climbed into the lifeboats, lifting shivering men onto the Comanche's deck. Even though David was one of the lowest ranking men on his ship and his own nation considered him a second class citizen, he willingly put his life at risk to save his fellow Americans. During the precarious operation, the Comanche's executive officer, Lieutenant Langford Anderson, fell overboard. Without hesitation, David dove into the deadly waters to save Anderson. He then lifted a second shipmate, David Swanson, back onto the Comanche when Swanson had grown too weak from helping others. Swanson recalled that David was a tower of strength who shouted encouragement to his fellow sail sailors during the ordeal. In addition to the two men whom David single-handedly saved, he and his shipmates rescued 93 of the 203 survivors from the Dorchester. Shortly after Charles David's heroics, <coughs> he contracted pneumonia from his time in the icy water. 54 days later, on March the 23rd, he died in a hospital in Greenland. The Coast Guard posthumously awarded him the Navy <coughs> and Marine Corps medals. His widow and young son received the medal from Rear Admiral Stanley Parker and Lieutenant Anderson, the man David had pulled to safety. In 2010, the U.S. Coast Guard named a Sentinel-class cutter in his honor. Carl Sandburg once wrote, courage is a gift. Those having it never know for sure whether they have it until the test comes. Jesus of Nazareth said, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. This coming Tuesday is the 247th birthday of the United States of America. 
as we consider and celebrate our country's independence, it is right and good to raise our voices in thanksgiving for the heroic service and sacrifice of our fellow Americans whose courageous and selfless dedication has secured the freedoms we enjoy. But patriotic loyalty and courage are not the only lessons to be learned from the sinking of the Dorchester. Think about it for a minute. Two Protestants, a Catholic and a Jew, were willing to set aside their religious differences to serve a greater cause, saving the lives of their countrymen and comforting the dying. They didn't refuse to work together because they didn't agree on everything. They disagreed on things most of us consider non-negotiable, the true path to salvation, the identity and nature of Jesus Christ, but they were still willing to set those things aside for something even greater. Why is this not something that Americans do every day, not just in the face of death? Why can we not do this? If those chaplains could do it, why can't our political leaders do it? Why can't we? Why does it have to take something like death to make us finally come together and realize that we are one people? Seaman David could have let his exec down. He could have said, one less white man to worry about. And the others on board could have lied and taken credit for the rescue and said, oh no, David didn't have anything to do with it. We did it. But they didn't. David did not see the color of the men he was rescuing and he was properly recognized for his bravery even in an era of Jim Crow laws. We see in the tragedy of the Dorchester crucial lessons about higher causes and strength and diversity. America is stronger, stronger because of our racial and ethnic and religious diversity. We would be so much less if we were all just alike. And the military was way ahead of us in working for equality, and it still is. It feels like those lessons have been forgotten. Now all it takes to make us stop working together or start hurting each other, beyond the walls of the church, and even God help us inside the walls of the church. All it takes to make us divide us from one, other, one another is our political affiliation, our party that we belong to. We are better than that, brothers and sisters in Christ. And don't think this isn't about church. These lessons, religiously and ethnically, You've heard this before, it's still true. Sunday morning is still the most segregated time of the week, isn't it? Now we not only divide up by race, we also divide up by political party on Sunday morning. We divide into our little enclaves of like-minded and same-skinned friends, and we imagine that we're holier because of it when it's just the opposite. Of all people, the followers of Jesus Christ ought to know better. We ought to do better. But today is about more than remembrance and honor today. It's more than a call to honor and celebrate and promote diversity and mutual respect in our country and our churches. This has to be a day when we remember and profess that God alone is our deliverer. God alone can heal the pride and the sin that inevitably lead to conflict and war. You and I affirm in our baptism and in our life together that the delivering, healing God came to us in Jesus Christ so that we might be reconciled to one another and reconciled to God. This is what we believe. This is what should be the foundation of our lives. God does not want us to hurt each other. God is on the side of the victims, not the victors. Remember those words from Isaiah. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That is God's vision for us. That's not some pie in the sky by and by schmaltzy idealism, friends. It is God's vision for us and it is God's calling for those who follow Jesus Christ. The job of every warrior 
The job of every Christian is not to glorify war or perpetuate war, but to do all that we can to end it forever. And that commitment to end war begins with our personal relationships, and it widens out to include our workplace, our neighborhood, our community, our city, our county, our state, our nation, and finally our entire world. We are called in everything we do, in every place we go, to be messengers of peace and reconciliation. Romans 12 says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, the vengeance is mine. I will repay, says who? The Lord. Romans 14, let us then pursue what makes for peace and mutual uh, building. Romans 15, the God of peace be with all of you. As citizens of the kingdom of God, we are called by Christ our King to be instruments of God's grace, mercy, and peace. So as we celebrate the gift of freedom on Tuesday, the greatest honor that we can pay those who sacrificed for it, living or dead, is to embody the prayer of St. Francis, which turns out to be a pretty good job description for the citizens of God's kingdom. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to life eternal. Amen. Let's sing number 431, Let There Be Peace on Earth. 431. Let's affirm our faith with the words printed in your bulletin. 
We believe in God the Father who reveals his love to us in Christ. We believe in God the Son who pours out God's Holy Spirit on us. We believe in the Holy Spirit who teaches us God's truth. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. We'll start with joys and celebrations in our time of sharing. Obviously, we celebrate our country's birthday this coming Tuesday. What a wonderful day that will be. We also celebrate the birthday of another ancient thing, Dan Jenkins. <laughs> Dan will be 73 years old tomorrow. Happy birthday, Dan Jenkins. Okay, and the hips, and he's doing great. I'm glad to that. What are our other joys and celebrations today? Any others? Then let's move to our concerns. Please continue to pray those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Pray for those who are sick. Please continue to lift up Charles and the Sike family. Charles was diagnosed last, late last week with aggressive acute leukemia. And so he will begin treatment this coming week. So please keep Jeanette and Paul and the rest of the family in your prayers. Please pray for Cindy Scott, who was hospitalized Friday. She hopefully will be getting out today or tomorrow. Pray for Jazz Woodward and others who are recovering from surgery. Jazz's surgery was successful, and he's back home. Pray for the Reverend Don Hodges, for Ruth Waters, and others in our church family who are at home. Pray for Rich Meyer, who's not doing well, and others who are in rehab or nursing homes. Obviously, on this weekend, if no weekend, any time else during the year, we want to remember all of our military personnel serving here, at home, and abroad. We pray for their safety. And we pray for the people of Ukraine and Russia. When I think of let there be peace on earth, I pray for peace in that place which is such a horrible place right now and so dangerous for them and for all of us. Are there other concerns you have to lift up before the body today? Any others? Then let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, bless our lives, sanctify us, and in your own way, give us our heart's desire. Anoint us with your grace that what our hearts desire is also what you desire. May the love of Christ urge us on. May we walk by faith. Thank you, God, for all of our blessings. Lord, we know persons, all of us know persons with needs beyond our ability to fix. We thank you for all of those who attend to the sick and the weary and those who feel separated from you and separated from the church and even separated from the people around them. Hear our prayers today for those who need a special measure of your grace. We lift up Charles and all those who we named aloud earlier and ask your blessings upon them. And in this world of richness, help us also remember the poor, not only in our thoughts and our prayers, but also in our loving actions, for they are all our brothers and sisters. Through our caring and giving and helping and living with the poor, may we be Christ to them, and may we see you incarnate in them. Through Jesus, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And I'd like to offer one last prayer before I leave and go to the 9 o'clock service, a prayer for our country. Let us pray. Almighty God, you rule all the peoples of the earth. Today we give you thanks for all the good that has been accomplished in America and by America. To those who make our laws, give courage, wisdom, and foresight to provide for the needs of all our people and to fulfill our obligations in the community of nations. To judges and others in our legal system, give understanding and integrity that human rights may be safeguarded and justice served. And finally, teach us all to rely on your strength and to accept our responsibilities to our fellow citizens, that we may serve you faithfully in our generation and honor your name. 
Give to all who love our country a commitment to use our freedoms in accordance with your will. And give us the courage and consideration to extend those freedoms to everyone, excluding no one just because of who they are. We thank you, Lord, for our nation, and yet we also confess today that we have not always done what is right and pleasing in your sight. Forgive our shortcomings as a nation. Purify our hearts to see and love the truth. Deliver us from the curse of war and all that creates it. Deliver us from willful ignorance and selfish isolation. Deliver us from fear and distrust of those not like us. Deliver us from the greed for riches, power, and status. Deliver us from a lack of love. Forgive us and heal us, O Lord, that we may all live daily in your image. We pray all of these things through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters, and God bless America. Happy Fourth of July to you. I'm looking for him. <laughs> I'm looking for hers to give me some hymns. 698, 1 and 4. Bump.
I four, five, one, and two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Now let us offer the best of ourselves and our blessings and present them as an offering to God.
Can we stand? Peace of the Lord be always with you. Our hymn is 519. Lift every voice and sing. <laughs> 